end this message this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to, to preach your word. I'm so thankful that, that we get a chance to do that, Lord God, right here in this church and for this congregation. I thank you for this congregation and thank you for everybody who's here this morning. And God, we're, we're streaming um, out into the internet. And so I ask that you use this message in the way that, that you want to use it, Lord God. Have your will today. Lord, speak through me. Thank you for walking with me as I prepare this, God, and, and help me to understand what to strike, what to keep, and what to add. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's a subject that I've been thinking about for a while. This is called Piercing the Darkness. This is a message which might seem strange to me right after Thanksgiving. Um, you would think that I would be giving you a message on being thankful. And I, and I am. Because I'm thankful for the power of God, for the power of the Holy Spirit to break every stronghold. I'm thankful for that. And because I am a temporary intern preacher, I don't necessarily have to follow all of the, the standard things. Uh, so instead of doing a Thanksgiving message today, we're going to talk about a little bit of a different, different subject. We're going to learn. We're going to grow. And with God's help, we are going to overcome. I have a personal observation. From my personal observation, it appears to me, now I tried to track down some research to confirm my, my personal observation. What do you call that when you have uh, empirical? My empirical data, which is my observation data, tells me that anxiety has increased in our society in recent years. I personally know many who struggle uh, with anxiety issues. Uh, with, and anxiety is, you know, a form of fear. It's it's really um, an irrational fear that uh, that takes over your, you know, your thoughts, and you can't you can't control, can't you know that it isn't right, but you can't stop it. So, my personal observation, and I could be wrong is that anxiety has appeared to increase. The cases of anxiety in our society appear to increase. And I think that there's factors behind that. We can look at social media. I mean, there's studies after studies that have shown that social media is harmful to people. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we're, we're having hearings in Congress about uh, you know Facebook executives who ignored the studies who found that social media was causing uh, young uh, female teens to self-harm and all kinds of other things. Well, they, they didn't care because they're, they're making money. And uh, I've talked many times about the way that our modern news cycle works now, where it's very polarized, and the only thing that really gets news and gets, and gets played is if it's trying to get you going. It's trying to kick in your fears. You know, they always say, that old saying, uh, sex sells. Well, I think what they, they, they're also adding in fear. You know, fear sells. There's, there's some radio personalities. I'm a radio nerd because I travel so much. Um, even though you see us up here doing music, I actually don't listen to music very much when I travel. <laughs> it's a special time if I listen to music. It's because... I need to think. Um, otherwise, I'm listening to speaking things. I used to listen to talk radio all the time. You know, the guy with the formerly nicotine, st nicotine stained fingers, I used to listen to him quite a bit. I used to listen to Glenn Beck quite a bit. But I started to realize, okay, no offense to you if, you're, if you follow those guys, but they kind of build an industry around fear. Okay, so Glenn Beck, for example, love the guy, don't listen to him anymore. 
because eventually there is no problem that, that he shows you that's actually going to get solved. He doesn't want it to get solved because he's actually, you know, stoking your fear. And then, by the way, you can buy all this, you know, dry food here and generators for when the end of the world comes and you go in your bunker. And keep listening and, you know, selling this stuff. So, uh, it's, again, that's not, a, that's not a dig on those guys, but I just realized that there, there is an economy of fear. Yeah. Whew! That was not in my notes. <laughs> Who's behind the economy of fear? Satan is behind the economy of fear. Because who is God? And what does God say about fear? He's not a God of fear. No, he is not. So, to my mind, what the, the ultimate, we can blame social media, we can blame media, we can blame the news, we can blame the commentators, we can blame whoever we want. But who is behind it all? The root of all fear is the devil himself. Yeah. That's where it's coming from. Yeah. So that is what we're going to talk to them, talk about today. Is the subject of demonic oppression. Okay? You do not have to be afraid during this message. I want you just to listen, to participate. Okay? God is on our side. Amen. Let's just say that right off the bat. The time is getting closer for the return of the king. So in this time, the, 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 the battle between the forces of darkness and the forces of light, man, it's coming to a head. Because there is limited time for Satan to do what he's trying to do. He's a liar. He's got a limited time to get people, get people's eyes off of Jesus. He doesn't have to take everybody into full-on Satanism, where you're carving a swastika on your forehead and a pentagram on your back. He just has to get your eyes off of Jesus and get you disconnected from the body of Christ. And he uses a lot of tools to do it. We're going, to do, we're going to go through a lot of scripture today um, in preparing this message. I don't feel qualified to give this message, but I believe that my message is qualified by scripture. And by the time that I was done preparing the message, I realized that I had written a book full of scriptures. <laughs> we're, 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 we've got a lot of scripture today. We've got a lot, of, a lot of ground to cover. And that's why I asked God to help me figure out if something needs to be skipped and deleted in the message. But let's just dive right in to God's word. 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Can we say that one together? Got it up there? Say it together with me. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Yes, Lord. Yes, amen. Let that be our message, our verse that we recall and remember through the rest of this message. There is a battle for souls. That is what the battle is, is that it is happening. It's for souls. The word tells us this repeatedly. I'm very uh, cognizant and careful. If, if I prepare a message, I don't want to tell you an opinion. I want to tell you what the word says. And so I will do my best to present the word. Scripture reveals some facts to us about the battle that is going on. Satan was an angel in heaven created by God along with all of the other angels before the creation of earth. 
His name was Lucifer. Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 tell us that Satan was created as a very beautiful creature and was an anointed guardian cherub. He was most likely, most likely, the highest of angels. Satan grew proud and rose against God and sought to kick God off of his throne and take his place and become God himself. There was a war in heaven and Satan was kicked out of heaven. Even Jesus said, I saw like lightning going from heaven to the earth. As Jesus witnessed this. Satan was kicked out of heaven and cast to earth. Satan in heaven, before he was kicked out, had built himself a coalition of other angels to be with him. And when he rebelled, they rebelled with him and they were also cast out. These are the demonic forces that we refer to, who do the bidding of the devil. Referring to Revelation 12, 3 to 4, it is possible that a third of the angels were cast out with Satan. According to John writing in the book of Revelation, Revelation 12, 9, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. I want to tell you something about the devil. The devil fights dirty. You think about military engagements, and we have our country who goes to war and theoretically, by law, they are supposed to abide by the rules of engagement, the Geneva Convention. Now the trouble that we had when we went to fight terrorism is this, they don't have any rules of engagement. Their rules of engagement are win at any cost. So we ended up with weird situations. We ended up with Gitmo. Guantanamo Bay. We ended up with like, what do we do? Okay, because we're trying to fight within the bounds of our of, of the legal rules and all this, and these other guys are. Well, that's kind of like the war between God and the devil. God allows us free will. The devil would really like you to not have free will. So he can influence you in any way. including what we would refer to as oppression, he will do it. If that's what it takes, he will do it. He doesn't have any rules. He fights dirty. So how does he fight? 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The Greek word for devil is diabolos, which means slanderer false accuser. He is called the father of lies. So how does he fight? The devil lies to mankind about God. That's how, that's what he did to Eve. He lies to God about mankind. That's what he did to Job. He accuses us before the throne of God. He is an expert at developing division. A house divided cannot stand. After all, he divided heaven. So he attacks the world by causing and encouraging division and by lying about the nature of God. 
Did God really say blah, blah, blah? The God I know would never, and that, and that. You heard people say that? The Jesus I know would never, blah, blah, blah. Why do you think I like doing the Luke study so much? Because I want to know the Jesus of the Bible. I don't want to know the Jesus, your Jesus. I want to know the real Jesus. He encourages us to make up our own God. So our own version, after our own hearts, rather than after his heart. In the scriptures, we see Satan influencing Eve by lying, and she fell for it. We see Satan attempting to influence Jesus, but he resisted, and he overcame. But when it comes to you and I, the regular people, how does the devil work? Again, his first tool is the lie. He's the father of lies. What does that mean? The father of lies. That means he invented the lie. There was no lie before Satan invented it. Could you imagine living in a time before lies? Wow. <laughs> it's so hard to imagine. What are some of the lies he tells us? There is no God. You really believe there's a God? There's a Satan, he says. You are so naive. Don't you believe in science? You're a dummy. There's another one. You don't need God. What good has God done for everyone? And you hear that all the time now. I hear that all the time. Look at the state of the world. Here's a personal one. You're a loser. You are no good, and you never will be, and no one will ever love you. That's a lie from the devil. Here's another one. You call yourself a Christian, but you can't even get through a day without failing at it. You're no good. There's none of You can't even resist sinning. You will never measure up to God's standards. Just give up. Those are the lies that the devil whispers in the ears of people every day, and many more. You don't know who you are. You don't even know what gender you are. And many more. So the devil attacks us by lying to us. He lies to us about the nature of God and tries to make us believe that there is no hope for us. But the devil can go farther than just whispering these untruths. According to the scriptures, the forces of darkness are actually capable of causing mental and physical harm in some cases. It's possible for us to open a door that will allow the devil to gain some influence over us. Paul says this in Ephesians. Ephesians 4, 26 to 27. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Verse 27. And do not give the devil a foothold. Jesus says this, Matthew 12, 43 to 45. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first, so also will it be with this evil generation. Even the apostle Paul experience demonic oppression. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. 7. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. 
Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect, perfect in weakness. So what could demonic oppression look like? What are the symptoms? First, let me say that not every physical or mental condition is a result of demonic oppression. We live in a fallen world. We get sick. We have mental issues. Um, we go to the doctor. The doctors can help us. Not everything is demonic oppression. Not every thought. Not every struggle. Not every problem. Sometimes your problems are your own dumb fault. <laughs> because of your choices. However, the scripture tells us that demonic oppression can cause both mental and physical issues. Let's look at scripture. In 1 Samuel 18, we are given insight into King Saul and David's relationship. King Saul brought David into his household and made him a general of his army. 1 Samuel 18. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him. So that Saul sent him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. As they were coming home, so they're coming back from battle, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul... Watch this. Saul was very angry, and this saying displeased him. And remember, Saul hired David to be his general. Saul brought David into his household because he was best friends, soul brothers, with Saul's son, Jonathan. David is like a second son to Saul. Saul was very angry, and this saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me, they have ascribed thousands. So they give David ten thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day on. Watch this. The next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul, and he raved, some of the translations say raged, within his house while David was playing the lyre, as he did day by day. Saul had his spear in his hand, and Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. He's going to kill him. He tried to murder him. But David evaded him twice. Notice that Saul first allowed jealousy. He allowed a foothold in his life. He allowed jealousy to get a foothold. <laughs> And as soon as he allowed this, he was oppressed by a harmful spirit, or some uh, transitions will say evil spirit, and raged in his house. And he tried to murder David. And he, from that point on, Saul had, had mental issues. He dealt with this. He, this wasn't the first time that he, or this wasn't the only time that he tried to kill David. He tried to spear him again. And then he just started chasing him around, trying to kill him with his army. It started here. The author of, gospel, of the Gospel of Luke was a physician, a doctor. Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke wrote his Gospel from the perspective of a Greek doctor. And as such, he pays special attention to things like healings. He notes little details, specific details. It's interesting to me that Dr. Luke documents the healings performed by Jesus, and he notes that sometimes the reason for the affliction was demonic. Sometimes. Luke 13, 10 through 13. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. What was she crippled by? A spirit. She was bent over and could not straighten up. 
Luke does not always include a statement about demonic influence when it comes to sickness. From his account, it appears that demons can cause physical and mental sickness, but physical and mental sickness are not always caused by demons. Let's look at another verse in uh, uh, scripture in Luke, Luke 4, 40 to 41. When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one and healed them. And demons came out of many, crying and saying, You are Christ the Son of God. In this passage, we see Jesus healing the sick from various diseases and also casting out demons. Two different things. So, we can make some conclusions from Scripture about demonic influence. It can cause sickness, physical sickness, infirmities, depression, anxiety, and other mental issues. It can result in increased temptation to sin. It can be used for clairvoyance, fortune telling. Paul and the, and the slave girl with the spirit of definition, uh, uh, sorry, spirit of divination in Acts 16. There's an example. It can, in some cases, allow demonic control over someone's body, resulting in great strength, violence, and, and harm to that person's body, harm to the host. So, as a born-again child of God, can we be oppressed by the devil? If we are blood-bought Christians, if we are saved, if you are listening and you are not saved, you need to get saved. What does the Bible say about getting saved? It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe and you shall be saved. Believe that he is the Son of God, that he died on a cross for your sins, that he rose in three days, and that he ascended on high and seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And if you will accept that, and give your life to Christ, you are saved. You are blood bought. Amen. Amen. If you are, you cannot be possessed by the devil. Okay? We're talking, we're making a distinction. Because you belong to Christ. Amen. And we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We belong to God. Therefore, we cannot be the possession of the devil. He doesn't own you anymore. If you give your life to Christ, he does not own you anymore. Amen. Jesus bought you with his blood. Amen. Amen. However, you may still be able to be oppressed. by demonic influence. Scripture warns us not to allow the devil to get a foothold in our lives, and this is why. We are we're under constant attack. The devil and his forces are constantly lying to us, constantly tempting us, and when we give in to this temptation, we crack open that door. If you're listening and you find yourself repeatedly, I'm sorry, but the scripture calls it like a dog returning to his vomit. If you find yourself repeatedly returning to the same dark sin over and over and over and over again, you could be experiencing demonic oppression. And that needs to be broken from you. We can experience increased fear, 
This is just some of, uh, again, uh, some, some of the, the symptoms that you might associate with demonic influence. It, um, increased fear, increased anxiety, depression, anger, bitterness, distance from God. You can start to feel like God can't forgive you or accept you. And you can experience eventually desire to withdraw from the fellowship of the body. Which is why we are told not to forsake the gathering together of the body. If you're not going to church, you need to go to church. Get there. If you can physically get there, physically get there. This isn't good enough. If you have no other choice, then this is awesome. You are being, it, it's a blessing that we have technology where we can, we can beam into each other's, other's places. But, but we are encouraged and told to gather as a body. Amen. It's scriptural. Yes. But why does the devil want to get you out of church? Remember what he does. How does he hunt? He hunts like a lion. He hunts like a lion, seeking who he can devour. How many of you watched the National Geographic special on lions hunting? What do they do? How do they hunt? They see a little pack of zebras. It's like, oh, there's a pack of zebras over there, and I'm hungry. And they start sneaking up on them, and the zebras are smart. They gather together. And they say, you can't get us. If you come over here, we'll kick your teeth in. And the lion's like, I don't want to get my, keep my teeth kicked in. So they just keep hanging out. They just keep hanging out. They just keep hanging out until one of those zebras is dumb enough to walk away from the herd. You go check out what's over here. Even though he's been done told, don't go away from the herd. He comes over here, and the lion says, I got dinner. It's Thanksgiving time on the Sahara. We're having zebra. And the lion goes and he kills this guy because he's alone. And he devours him. He eats him. Because he left his fellowship and the strength and the companionship and the protection of those around him. And he went away and he got attacked and he got devoured. That's how the devil hunts. He separates the weak from the herd. If he can get you alone, Away from your church and the people of God, he can keep on eating you. Amen. If you're listening to this and God is speaking to you, perhaps he is revealing to you that you are experiencing oppression. From the devil, then I want to give you some hope. I have good news for you. Remember, this is called piercing the darkness. It's not called get put in the darkness and sit there and cry. We're going to pierce the darkness. We pierce the darkness with the Son of God. That is a hope. Okay? Let's talk about it. You do not have to live your life under the thumb of oppression. You don't have to. If you are, you don't have to stay there. That's not even God's will for you. You think I know what God's will is for you? I know this much. He doesn't want you to be living under demonic oppression. Yeah. I think I can safely say that. Yeah. Jesus died for this very reason. Jesus died so that you can have the victory over the devil. Colossians 2, 9-15. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive 
together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Come on! Do you see it? Did you hear it? In the scripture, it's there. That's what he did for you. That's what he did for me. He didn't just go up on a cross and die so we could all, you know, wear little crosses and think what a nice story. That's not a nice story. It's a horrible story. It was the only way for him to accomplish this. Ephesians 1, 17 to 23, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Thank you, God. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance of the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ that he, when he raised him from the dead and he seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age but also in the world to come and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things in the church which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all. Amen. 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 Jesus has been given all power and authority over all. Nothing can stand against him. The word says he is our advocate. He is our advocate standing on our behalf before the Father. When the devil accuses us and lies, when the devil says, look at that one right there. That one is no good. Jesus stands before the throne. And he says, wrong. I bought him. He is mine. His name is written in the book of life. Through Jesus Christ, we have been given given freedom from a life governed by sin. Amen. An authority. We have been given authority yeah. over the influence of the demonic. Yeah. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sin in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love for which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespass, trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us up with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. We are told to stand against the devil wearing the armor of God and that our defense is the scripture, the sword of the spirit. We know this in Ephesians. 6, 11 through 18, we're all familiar. Put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual weaknesses in high places. So we put on the whole armor of God that we'll be able to withstand the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, the breastplate of righteousness. Have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. 
Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We are given the authority of Christ to drive away the devil. It's in the book. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. In fighting against demonic oppression, we are called to pray. And as the scripture says, to pray in the spirit. But we also have the authority to speak directly to the demonic in the name of Jesus Christ. Let me read you what a theologian, Wayne Grud, says on this subject. He says, we may ask, however, why does God want Christians to speak directly to the demons, the demon who is troubling someone, rather than just praying and asking God to drive away the demon for them? In, this, in a way, this is similar to asking why Christians should share the gospel with another person rather than simply praying and asking God to reveal the gospel to that person directly. Or why should we speak words of encouragement to a Christian who is discouraged rather than just praying and asking God himself to encourage the person directly? Why should we speak a word of rebuke or a gentle admonition to a Christian who we see involved in some kind of sin rather than just praying and asking God to take care of the sin in that person's life? The answer to these questions is that in the world that God has created, he has given us a very active role in carrying out his plans, especially his plans for the advancement of the kingdom and the building up of the church. In all of these cases, our direct involvement and activity is important in addition to our prayers. And so it seems to be in our dealing with demonic forces as well. Like a wise father does not settle all of his children's disputes for them, but sometimes sends them back out to the playground to settle the dispute themselves, so our Heavenly Father encourages us to enter directly into conflict with demonic forces in the name of Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thereby, he enables us to gain the joy of participating in eternally significant ministry and the joy of triumphing over the destructive power of Satan and his demons in people's lives. Jesus, Jesus demonstrated his authority over demons. After his death and resurrection, he instructed his disciples in this way. Mark 16, 15 to 17. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. In my name shall they cast out devils. According to Jesus, we have the authority to cast out demons in his name. we're going to do this morning to end this. And so I'm going to play some music here.
but it's someone that you are close to, someone that you know that is struggling with this, I'm going to ask you to come forward. We're going to shut off our um, live stream at this time. This is private. This is for us.